We are, um, uh, were you blessed by Pastor Preston? Oh my goodness, that was awesome. Um, I want to apologize in advance because we're going to be trying to fit into about 20 minutes what sometimes takes two or three hours to do. So we're going to be rushing through some things. So, sweetie, go ahead with the definition. We want to just do a real quick overview of what def, uh, def, uh, the definition of forgiveness, and it's broadly understood as a decreasing, uh, of, as a process of decreasing interrelated negative resentment based emotions, motivations, and cognitions. Now, that's a technical definition. And, uh, but I want to just emphasize forgiveness is both a process and a decision to release another person from a debt that they would owe us due to an offense perceived or real. That's the one I want you to remember. I'm willing to let go of the debt that you owe me. Uh, that's what I'm willing to do in terms of forgiveness. There's a, uh, an institute at the University of Madison, Wisconsin called the Institute for the Study of Forgiveness. And their research has revealed that there are all kinds of physical benefits to forgiveness. There are psychological and relational benefits to forgiveness. Um, and, and, and so reduction in fatigue, enhancing self, you know, well-being. I mean, there are all kinds of wonderful benefits to forgiveness. So now I'm, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the scriptural you know, uh, problems, not problems, but theology of forgiveness. I do want to say in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, that the basis of forgiveness is not because someone deserves it or not because that they ask you for forgiveness, but because we've been forgiven. That's, that's, that's our motivation, that we have been in the stream of God's grace. Therefore, we are to give grace. Matthew 18, forgiveness is a principle of life. You know, when Peter asked, how many times should I forgive? You know, seven times 70. It's, it's meant to just be a way that Christians live. In the parable of the unforgiving debtor, the bottom line of that is that forgiveness occurs in the heart. And a lot of times people think that they have forgiven, but they really haven't forgiven from the heart. And so it doesn't last. It doesn't hold up. And so as we're going through this, what I'd like to challenge us to do, please, is think of someone who's hurt you. Is there anyone here who's never been hurt? Okay, if you've been hurt, think of someone who's hurt you and think about whether you have truly released that person, whether you've really forgiven. And we're going to, to challenge you in that area if you've not. So... In Matthew uh, 6, 20, 6, 12, you know, for, freely, forgiveness is freely given to all persons, but, you know, we, we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive someone else. So we're really asking to the same degree that I've forgiven somebody else, Lord, please forgive me to that same degree and no more. So, so um, forgiveness also is connected to righteous anger, um, you know, was Jesus angry when he cleansed the temple? For real angry? Yeah, yeah, he was. Is Jesus angry when innocent people are, are oppressed, when they're hurt? Woe unto you if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, right? Would be better if a millstone were tied around your neck. So Jesus is righteously angry when little ones are hurt. So my question is, is it important for us to join him in that anger when we're hurt? In righteous anger, which does not seek to destroy or kill the one, but enables us to set healthy boundaries and say, look, you can't do that again to me. That's not okay. That's what our anger does if it's holy, righteous anger. Uh, the other piece about righteous anger is that it allows us to uh, envision a different future. This happened to me in the past, but righteous anger uh, helps me propels me to see a different future, a different than my past that I, am ju I have just experienced. So there are some myths to forgiveness that we want to go through with you. One is forgive and forget. So, yeah, forgive and forget is not true. Uh, first of all, 
the brain is wired such that everything that ever happens to us, we recall. And I mean, we have it stored in our memory. We may not be able to recall it, but it's there. And so you'd have to have a lobotomy not to remember what has happened to you. And so it's not forgive and forget. Uh, it's not you just erase all of this good stuff. On the other hand, God says, I will cast your sins where? Into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so far I've put your transgressions from you. So if you have chosen to forgive someone, you relinquish the right to ever bring it up and use it as a weapon against them. Don't take skeletons out of the closet. If you do, it means you haven't forgiven yet. You haven't forgiven yet. So um, forgive, here's another myth. Forgiveness implies trust, OK? You know, f forgiveness is freely given, but trust is earned over time, right? And so don't confuse the two. Just because you've forgiven someone doesn't autom automatically mean you can trust them. They have to earn that trust back. Forgiveness is easy. We have this idea. Uh, I remember uh, a couple years ago when this young man went through the church in South Carolina and in the States and, and shot up a bunch of uh, black people and people were on TV, uh, the family members were on TV within hours saying, I forgive this young man. And I was screaming at the TV, no, you haven't forgiven him because you don't even know what you lost yet. You're still in shock. You have not experienced the full impact of your loss. And so, you know, I know we want to say, you know, forgiveness is easy, but it's not easy. And as you see, it will cost us something as we walk through this very quickly. And the other thing is that as Christians, we should forgive right away. Remember, forgiveness is a process. It's a journey sometimes. And sometimes as Christians, even though we know it's in someone's best interest to forgive, they're not quite there yet. And to try and force them or coerce them to forgive is really violating them or hurting them rather than coming alongside them and helping them on the journey. Holding on to bitterness does not hurt anyone. Again, you've heard that saying that um, being bitter is like uh, taking poison in for, of yourself and thinking you're going to hurt the, your, your enemy. It doesn't work that way. And so bitterness does hurt yourself. And by extension, everyone that comes into your circle of influence, you, they are being impacted by your bitterness. And so there's a process of forgiveness that we want to go through with you. The first one is to tell your story about what happened. You know, when you were hurt, you have a story about that, right? You know, the people who were involved in what happened. But telling your story is to discover what the offenses were that hurt you. In other words, what do I need to forgive? Now, we understand we're talking to people who don't talk. We get it. We understand that. But um, again, let me emphasize the point that I made yesterday, and that is keeping a secret, keeping a secret about your story, keeping things private, as you like to say. Uh, it does more damage to you than the actual events itself. So whatever happened to you, and you want to keep it private, you're doing more damage. And uh, as we just uh, heard from Pastor Preston, you really are depriving God of his glory when you don't share what he has done for you. You know, several of you all came to me and talked about how brave I was to talk about being raped and, and you know, not once, not twice, but three times. And I didn't say that I was raped by the same individual. I mean, my story is really crazy. And yet I have no shame. Why? Because uh, I'm washed. I'm sanctified, I'm justified in Jesus. You get to think whatever you want to think. It's what he's done for me already, so I can tell my story. I don't really care what the church people say about me. I don't really care what you think about me because Jesus has said, I'm all right. I'm a bag of chips. I'm all that and a bag of chips. So that's who I am, and so it doesn't matter what you think about no, me. No, no, it's fish and chips, honey. Okay, that, I'm that, sorry. That's <laughs> But the, the next step is to, is to do exactly what's counterintuitive. You know, most of us, when, we're, when we hurt, we try to, you know, uh, use defense mechanisms to repress or suppress the pain and put it away and stuff it away in a garbage can. But here we're asking you to do just the opposite, to feel it and to embrace it. Yes, this is 
how I was hurt. These are the losses that I incurred as a result uh, of what happened. And sometimes those losses last forever in a person's life, you know, when we've really been hurt. So it's important to embrace it and, and then, though, not to do anything other than to receive the comfort of God. That's really very important. Uh, I was talking with someone yesterday, and I mentioned that we have to grieve what has ha happened to us. And so part of embracing our story is grieving that which has happened to us. I lost a lot when I was molested at three. I lost a lot when I lost my, my childhood at 13. I lost a lot. And so I had to grieve those losses and embracing that. And then as I'm in grieving and embracing my pain, uh, I am now uh, able to connect with the God of all comfort who knows how to comfort my heart. He is the God of all comfort. And if I am talking about this God from 30,000 feet and he is being the God of all comfort, that's one thing versus being at ground zero with me and experiencing that comfort because of my pain. Two different experiences. Most of us are content here. Oh, but the, it's really rich when we get down here at this ground zero level where we experience the comfort of God. And the next step is, and, go well, ahead. And we also want, want to recognize the value of an empathic witness, yes. someone else who yeah. walks alongside us to comfort us as a human comforter as well. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, step four is Gethsemane. Very, very important. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? Come on, gang. Come on. You know, I got a little bit of time. What? Yeah, Jesus, he prayed and all that. So for the sake of time, we, I, I really like to spend time here in Gethsemane. And uh, I'm just going to pray that God's going to uh, really bless our time because it's so, so short. And uh, we were hoping to unpack this a little more. But Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He went in with the disciples, and I got to demonstrate, at least just demonstrate. So he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, the spotless son of God. And he walked in with his boys, and he fell down on his knees, and he prayed. But while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he who knew no sin became sin for us. And so there was a point where the sins of the world were laid onto Jesus. They were rolled onto him. That's what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now he walks out as the uh, sin bearer. He walks out as the one who is carrying the sins of the entire world. Very, very important process. Very, very important step. Now, our Gethsemane looks like this. We walk into the garden, the offended one. You know that person you have in your head that hurt you the most? You walk into this garden, you walk in with that person in mind, you walk into the garden, the offended one, and you fall down on your knees and you sweat great drops of blood as well because your prayer will be, Father, show me how I am just like the person who hurt me the most. You want me to say that again? Help me to see how I'm just like the person who hurt me the most. What we like to do is we like to think that I'm a little different from this person. They're over here and I'm over here. Or actually, I'm here and they're here. So the, my uncle who molested me, I am sitting high and looking low thinking I'm doling out forgiveness when really I'm sitting on a polished pile of poop and I haven't forgiven anybody. And so, because it's not mine to give. I don't have a forgiving bone in my body. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, now I am praying, and I promise you, you will sweat great drops of blood when you have to wrestle with how you're just like the person who's hurt you the most. And so you stay there until you do. And then you, as you do that, you ask God, you want to really be the sin uh, uh, bearer for that person in the sense that you want to take their sins and plead for them on behalf of Jesus because they have not or they cannot. And so like Jesus was the sin bearer, you are asking God, hey, God, I, am, I want to pray on behalf of this person. I am praying for this person. And that's why you can't leave until you sweat great drops of blood. 
you have to see how I am just like this person who hurt me so bad. And I, and Lord, I want, I, I want to pray on their behalf. I pray, Father, I, I beg your, your, your forgiveness for them because they don't have to. And the more they hurt you, the deeper your pain, the more your agony, and the more your intercession will be. Are you with me? Okay, and so now you walk out of the garden just like Jesus, the great sin bearer for that person who hurt you. Oh, I, I need you to get this. This part for sure. You walk into the garden offended one. You're on your knees asking God to help you to see how you're just like that person. And, and, and then stand, be willing to stand in the gap for that person as though you were pleading for them. You are pleading for them. Jesus, have your way in this person's life. Uh, I, I pray your blessings. I pray, Lord, that you would just touch them. This is the person who's hurt you the most. That's your Gethsemane. And you don't leave Gethsemane. You can pray that prayer. And sometimes you get to the door and you think you've done it. And then, oh, no, not quite. So you got to go back and you got to fall on your knees again. You tracking with me? Now, you know, we said how we didn't get a chance to set this up really well, but sometimes people say, oh, yeah, I forgive and I don't have uh, an issue with anybody. And then as we start unpacking this, people say, oh, well, let me look at this again here because I really don't even mind if, uh, uh, I, can I ask the question? I know we, we're on time crunch, and uh, they may have to have the, team, the praise team come up and get me because this is really important. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so we say, um, we, we ask this question, hey, if, if Jesus came to you, hypothetically, we know this this is a hypothetical situation. I get it. Understand me. I get it. But Jesus comes to you and says, hey, listen, the number is made up in heaven. I got one space left. It's between you and the person who hurt you the most. You get to make the choice. Who are you going to choose? Whatever you say, my child, we're going to do. Who are you going to choose? You can answer that any way you want. But, and, and you can answer that honestly. You know, who are you going to say? Lord, it, and, and, you know, people say, well, I, you know, I'm going to choose me, right? And, uh, but the truth is, the spirit of heaven is, Father, let that person in. They, they can go in. That's the spirit of heaven. And, and one lady said to me, well, I don't mind if they go to heaven. They just got to stay on the other side of heaven. They can't be my next door neighbor. Well, no, you haven't forgiven either. We do all this, this dancing that we do to think that we, we're forgiven, but we haven't. Gethsemane will lay your truth bare for you. And then we ask God to change our heart toward that person. Lord, you love that person. Help me love them freely and openly with, a, with an open heart as well. And then we then are ready to make a decision to forgive, which is to actually decide to release that person from the debt that they owe. Okay? Doesn't mean that what they did was okay, doesn't make it okay, but I'm no longer going to demand that they repay. And then we pray God's blessings upon them, and then we seek to reconcile with them according to Matthew 18. You know, to go to them, to, to let them know how they hurt you and how it's impacted you, and to let them know, of course, that you have forgiven them, though. But you seek to, to reconcile the relationship. Now, that's not always possible, is it? It's not always possible. Some people don't want to be reconciled. So, but, you know, all God holds you accountable for is the willingness to be. Right. Okay? Right. Your heart. And then finally, to establish healthy boundaries. There are toxic people in the world. For example, in the case of domestic violence, you don't want to advise someone, as, as many pastors do, oh, go back to him to be beaten up again, no, okay? If they're unhealthy, you set healthy boundaries and say, you know what, it's not okay for you to do that to me. I'm not gonna put myself in that position again with you. I love you, but for your sake, so that I don't contribute to your sinning again in the future, I'm gonna say no, I'm not going, I'm gonna set some boundaries with you. Again, there's a whole lot more to say about that, but. Now, this, this is really some really important points here as we're winding down. Um, I, I, there's a, we're made in God's image, and God is the perfect blend of justice and mercy. We have that in our bosom, too, justice and mercy. 
And oftentimes when we are, are going through the process of, of forgiveness, uh, you know, we really, we have to forgive that person. But as a victim, what do I need? Justice or mercy? Real quick. As a victim, I need justice. As a, as a victimizer, I need mercy. And so oftentimes people will say to us, hey, you know, you, 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 might, you might as well just forgive that person and, you know, let it go. But if I forgive them, am I going to get my justice? How am I going to get my justice? And typically we walk around with that imbalance. We may have uh, uh, had this, this, this sense of forgiving that person, but we haven't had justice. You with me? Somebody stole $5,000 from me. I can forgive them, but where's the justice of collecting money from, from me? How does, that, how does that work? Okay, where's the justice? And what we often do as victims, we want to go to the victimizer and get our justice from the victimizer. And yeah, can, Did you click it? We want to get our justice from the victimizer, and the reality is we cannot. Their blood is not efficacious enough. Only Jesus' blood is efficacious enough. And so we really, and Jesus is the only perfect victim, and so we have to go to Jesus and get our, our justice from him. He's the one that can give us the justice that we so long for. And as a victimizer, I have to go to him for mercy. And so right at the, at the cross is where we kiss together, the, the justice and mercy kiss together. And so my sense of justice cannot be satisfied. I went to my uncle, if I went to my uncle and said, please forgive me, I mean, my uncle would say, please forgive me, it wouldn't be enough. If he came to me now, I, he did that when I was three. His, his blood is not strong enough to go back and clean up my past. Only Jesus' blood can do that. And so, it's, it's so far, and I want, I want blood because ju blood is required to get justice. You don't get justice apart from blood. You got to have justice. You got to have blood to have justice. And then this next point, oh, th this is a powerful point. Th this is so powerful. You, you got to stay with me. This is powerful. And, you know, our framework is a sanctuary. And so... Because of what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane and the power associated with the Garden of Gethsemane, he walks in, the sins of the world are rolled onto him. Now, because our framework has been a sanctuary, we find some answers in the sanctuary. And the first six chapters of Leviticus uh, describe the offerings, you know, the uh, burnt offerings, and, and Moses get very specific instructions about the offerings. Uh, I like it in Numbers chapter 5. It says, if any people, uh, men or women, betray the Lord by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. They must confess their sin and make full restita restitution for what they have done, adding an additional 20% and returning it to the person who was wronged. Now, those are some powerful words. Let me tell you how they're so powerful. Jesus is the offering. Right? He's the offering. But we also know that because he took on the sin of my perpetrator, he took on the sin of my father, he stands in a place now where he has to restore everything that was taken from me. <laughs> Plus give me 20%. You want me to say that again? Yeah. So because Jesus took on my daddy's sin... He earned the right to be the one, if any people betray the Lord by doing wrong, Jesus is standing in my daddy's place. He's got to make restitution for me. Plus add 20%. Isn't that good? And now we, this verse makes sense. The verse that says, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. I can restore. He is doing it because he stepped in as my father, as my uncle, and says, I'm going to restore. Isn't that good news? And so the enemy doesn't care if we're talking about music or whether you should wear a hat on Sabbath or all of that stuff. This is good news, and we're missing it. And one more thing, I just got I, I to finish this up right quick. 
You know, in the beginning, God created, God, this Godhead had this wonderful relationship they enjoyed with one another. They created other beings, and then they created man, all for us to be a part of this fellowship and this wonderful community that they had. They wanted us to be a part of that. And then sin entered the picture. And I think, yeah, sin entered the picture. And so when sin entered the picture, don't go any faster, honey. When sin entered the picture, what happened then is there was a rupture in that relationship. And so as a result of sin, we had shame. We had, can you go back? Yeah, okay. We had shame and uh, diminishment that showed up, judgmentalism and the victim victimizer cycle. When you look at the story of Adam and Eve in the last chapter, last verse of chapter two, it says he, they were naked and not ashamed. And then when sin came in, they tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves. Is that correct? And so when they covered themselves up, it was because they felt shame, right? And so shame came in the picture. And ever since, we have all experienced shame and diminishment. We talk about each other. And you mean you eat like that? We diminish one another all the time. The world does it. The church does it. Everybody is about diminishment and shame and judgmentalism. Eve judged Adam. I'm sorry. Adam judged Eve. Eve judged the snake. And Adam and Eve both judged God. You gave me this woman. So they both were judged. We've been judging everybody ever since. And then there was this victim-victimizer cycle that set up. I got Eve was victimized by the snake. She went and victimized Adam. And then they both victimized God because they said, you created us. And so this victim-victimizer cycle was established. And in the, in the process, we've been doing it ever since. David didn't make up the bed this morning, so I'm going to fix him. I'm not fixing breakfast. Or I, 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 didn't, I didn't take David's laundry to the, to the cleaners, so he's going to fix me, and he's not going to uh, make up the bed. And so we are in this victim-victimizer cycle. We can do it very openly. Uh, you hurt me, I'm going to kick you back. Or, or we can do it very subtly, and I would suggest many people in the church try to do it subtle. But all this is a result of sin. The only perfect victim is Jesus. Jesus comes. We've been living when from, from the fall to the cross. We were looking forward to Jesus coming, the perfect victim come. And when Jesus came, he broke apart the victim-victimizer cycle. He took the shame of mankind upon himself, and he is the judge, and these judge, these people judged him, and they judged him as worthy, worthy of death. So can you get this? I, I'm doing this real quick because I know our time is over. The judge, Jesus, gets judged by mankind. It's kind of insane, but that's what happened. But he took it upon himself, and when he broke apart that victim-victimizer cycle, instead of giving victimization back to us, all he has for us is grace. That is all Jesus has for us is grace. There is no victimization. He only has grace. His design of love is all moved by, his, his grace is all moved by his design of love, his tremendous heart of love. That's all Jesus has for us. You know that God will permit people to hurt you so that you can be an instrument of grace. You can go and insert grace where grace would not appear. <laughs> God will permit people to hurt you so that you can be an instrument. You can be the kingdom in darkness. You can be love being inserted where love would not appear. Why? Because all God has for us is grace. And all, because I understand that, because I was once his enemy, I now look at my enemies and can be moved with compassion because Jesus was moved with compassion for me. I can come alongside them and do for them what Jesus did for me. Isn't that awesome? This is true. This is good news. And move on to the next one, honey. One more, one more, just one more, and I'm going to try to bring this thing home. I really, really love this subject because I said that. Okay, 
the truth is we live like the cycle is not broken. Do, do we not? We live as though Jesus did not do that. We live as though we're on the other side of the cross, before the cross. But the truth is that there is still, God wants us to see that we can stop the shame and diminishment that we do with one another. We can stop the judgmentalism and we can stop the victim victimization cycle. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's what it's about. God only has grace for us. And so our enemies can now, we can look on them and be moved as Jesus was moved for us. Isn't that wonderful news? And so now I ask you, who do you want to go into heaven? You want your enemy or do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. When you understand this thing is so big and we have this really simplistic thing, well, I need to forgive because I'm the one that's hurt and I need to forgive because it's hurting me. It had nothing to do with it. This is bigger than us. And the truth is, just like at the beginning, this is this one, my, my final point, my final point, my final point. Wait a minute, here come the musicians. See, I'm getting ready to get called out. Okay, my final point is just like God created and he had this community, he invited us into community and all this mess happened. If we were to draw the continuum on the timeline, God says, I'm going to restore and I'm going to set this kingdom up again and it will be as if you have never Sin. You're talking about adding 20%. It will be as if none of us have ever sinned. That's what he's trying to move us to. Isn't that good news? That's forgiveness. So remember the person that you were thinking about that maybe hurt you that you haven't forgiven yet? Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, I want to thank you for um, the gift that you've given us that we did not deserve. We didn't deserve forgiveness, Lord. We deserve death. That's what your word says. The wages of sin is death. And yet instead of that, Lord, you gave us grace. We're so thankful, Lord. And so now, Lord, work deep within us, deep within our hearts, Lord, that, that have been so devastated by by shame and victimization from other people, Lord. And, and that one person or those persons, Lord, that we're still holding something against, Lord, I invite you to go deep within our hearts. Be a source of comfort, Lord, and pull out by the root any dark bitterness that is there. And Lord, cast it into the sea of forgetfulness and replace it, Lord, with your love toward that person, Lord. Do this miracle within us, Lord, that we cannot do by ourselves. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.